So I have a confession to make in that um, when we had the sort of the call ahead of time, a panelist about what we were going to talk about, it was completely different from what I just heard. So um, we were told, well, actually, we were explicitly told that we really shouldn't talk all that much about, much about altmetrics because we didn't want to make it seem, I mean, altmetric.com, although I will, for sure. Um, and that really we were talking about um, how university press or society you know, press publishing is changing um, in this day and age, and, and in particular at a time when authors are calling more of the shots and we're really looking at kind of more author responsive models. So I'm going to be talking about that, but I'm, and I'm also going to be talking much more about books than about journals, although we do uh, publish journals. Um, and we do think a lot about author responsiveness at the MIT Press and a more author-centric model. And when I think about what things will look like uh, in the future in university press publishing, it really is much more um, you know, potentially a suite of a la carte services uh, for authors on the book side and the journal side, but we're very far from there. Um, and I think, you know, in this changing scholarly communication landscape, the publisher's most important role still remains, uh, you know, maximizing the readership and influence of an author's work. That is, that is our job. Um, but how we accomplish that today is very different um, from how we accomplished that in decades past. And as Elaine pointed out, you know, there's still a difference between publishing done well, which I like to think university presses do um, as very kind of ethical organizations, and just post it and they will come, right? The post it and they will come is not uh, a complete solution for most academic uh, authors. Um, so, um, so I'm uh, relatively new uh, as director of the MIT Press uh, as of a couple of years ago. Um, and I worked in several roles in publishing, including being at the press as an editor in the 1990s. Um, and when I was a press, uh, an editor at the press in the 90s, uh, we couldn't publish even a single professional book on the most kind of niche specific topic with a print run of less than about 1,200 copies because the academic library market um, was so substantial and would purchase generally around two-thirds of such an initial print run. And that's changed. You know, as you know, uh, libraries have greatly reduced the amount of print uh, collecting they're doing in favor of digital collecting. And I will talk about uh, what I see as some of the opportunities for university presses in the library ebook market. But I think what's clear uh, for university presses that, is that we can't keep doing what we've always been doing. Um, things have changed. Um, and not only have the markets have changed, but sort of the needs and preferences of our authors have changed. Um, and I think about, when I think about, you know, what kind of legacy would I want to create as a director of a press, which I am, it's really about future-proofing, you know, with sustainable models um, that are consistent with our values of openness and excellence and experimentation, um, and cognizant of the fact that those values may be um, somewhat different from commercial publishers. Sorry, that was, my, that was supposed to be the slide that I was on, the future proof. Uh, so when you walk into the offices of the MIT Press, there's this lit display wall of newly published books. And uh, it's a reminder to me um, in the morning when I walk into the office about my responsibility to my authors, to the authors of those books. And I think about it in two different ways. I think about it in terms of um, you know, the print book. Are we doing everything that we can to get these books out into of the world and to the readers that are interested in them, but also in terms of, of the digital landscape. Um, there are now digital files for all of these books in circulation, and we need to be focused on uh, making sure that all of this copyrighted content is accessible and searchable and discoverable now and into the future, uh, and increasingly in an environment where you know, anything we publish in digital form is going to be pirated. And so what does that mean for authors, and what does that mean for our, our long-term uh, game plan? Um, and these are the sorts of questions that, um, you know, apply uh, not just to publishers, but it is something that I think about on a regular basis. So here's an example of a book, The Sharing Economy, um, that we published last year as one of our uh, trade titles that uh, ended up on LibGen, which is the, the book version of Sci-Hub, within a couple of weeks uh, of publication. And I was giving a talk at a library conference in the fall, and I was talking about all the ebook piracy that we see. And, and talking about what I think of as the appropriate uh, reaction to it, which, again, may be different from how commercial publishers see it. Uh, and one of the librarians in the audience was fairly surprised and said, 
I didn't know about this and I don't want the powers that be at my institution to know about it because if they knew that all this free content was available, uh, you know, authorized or not, it would only mean further cuts in my budget, right? Um, and so I think libraries and university presses are very much in this together uh, in re-examining our relationship to and our, our relevance to the constituents that we serve. Um, and certainly thinking about um, you know, new objectives, new roles for our staff. I mean, at MIT, uh, the libraries and the press both have relatively new directors um, who are working closely together. And we're embracing a strategy that thinks about our relevance to the institution and to our authors um, in terms of being worthy of a place like MIT, right? This is an institution that values experimentation above all else. And so for us, being relevant to the, the scholars and the community that we're closest to is very much about you know, pushing the boundaries of scholarly communication uh, in content and in business models um, and in technology. Uh, so these are the slides where I would just be giving a quick history on the MIT Press and I'll just, um, we're uh, one of the large university presses. We publish about 300 books a year and currently 34 journals. Um, and that area is growing as well. We do a lot of open access publishing um, and uh, we publish across a range of disciplines. Uh, but with a, an especially strong identity in the sort of space that contains, you know, science, technology, art, and design. Um, and we're one of a relatively small number of university press publishers that has a significant journals publishing program. Uh, there are others, certainly um, Duke, uh, for sure, Chicago, uh, you know, the presses like, larger presses like Oxford and Cambridge, um, and we're really um, doing everything we can on the open access side there as well. And so this is part of, um, you know, these are our values, but also being responsive uh, to um, the, the interests and, and uh, mission of our authors uh, and the changing academic landscape. Um, now, one of, the, one of the things that I've seen and, and one of the things that I'm doing at the press um, in terms of being responsive to authors, a lot more researchers are really interested in reading, in reaching a wider readership for um, their work. And I don't, you know, I kind of have a theory about why that may be. I mean, you know, we've all gotten more comfortable through social media and stuff and um, expressing ourselves more informally. And so, you know, there, there's formal academic communication and informal communication, but a lot of it is bleeding into uh, researchers wanting to write for a broader audience and write for the trade. Um, and that's one of the things that um, we've invested in uh, in the last couple of years. So we've long published trade books or crossover books, but we're now really focused on trade science and technology. Uh, and you know, I think about it as, as spreading the gospel of science. But uh, another way in which publishers really uh, do expand access to research is by translating you know, technical content for non-specialist readers. Um, and for us, that has meant um, this kind of special kind of book, it's not the dumbed down blockbuster book that a New York trade house might do, it's really um, a book that uh, is for non-specialists who tend to be you know, more educated. So one, one of my colleagues had put it, uh, books that honor the complexity of their subject matter. Um, and the other great, what we're finding, the other great thing about growing this part of our publishing program at the same time that we're not, certainly not reducing the number of truly scholarly books that we're publishing, um, is that the uh, revenues from this help us do more open access publishing without subvention on the professional side. Uh, and so it's again a core part of our, our mission. So um, open access. Um, so everything that the press uh, publishes is uh, also published in digital form as of about uh, 10 years ago. Um, and, uh, and not infrequently when, when we publish in digital form we make op books openly available online. And even for the content that's not OA, we are moving away from strict DRM to a kind of a, a lightweight watermarking strategy. Um, and we often make, as I said, these e-books e open without subvention. Um, and for the first time this year, though, we are beginning to look at the kinds of uh, partnerships like Knowledge Unlatched. We're very excited about that. Um, and perhaps um, a little bit more unique is, is our relationship with the MIT Library. Um, so, you know, open access is not uh, 
black and white by any means. Um, our best-selling book um, of the last season has, is an OA textbook uh, called Deep Learning. Um, it had been available online before we published it, uh, and we were able to sell many thousands more copies than we ever anticipated. Um, you know, the book is very affordably, affordably priced, uh, and I think um, it's a great example of, um, you know, even though many publishers feel like they need to be more protective of their textbooks, how open access can work and how we're being responsive to, again, uh, academics. So we find in fields like computer science, uh, increasingly our authors are expecting uh, an open access option for their books, and it, it does appear to be uh, quite feasible to uh, sell books, sell print books while having an OA version available. Um, so even though um, you know, everything that we publish today is available in digital form, most of it is open, whether we've made it open or, or it's uh, unintentionally open, um, we're still finding that individuals prefer print to digital by a factor of about eight or nine to one. Uh, as you can see here, and it's a very different story on the institutional side where there's a strong preference for digital um, over print, and, and that is, is growing. Um, so, uh, you know, going back to what I said in that slide, looking at the collection of books at the MIT Press, there's this sort of juggling act between the print and the digital. Um, the persistence of the print book and the individual market on the one hand, and the growing uh, institutional uh, licensing market on the other. Um, and so part of our strategy going forward in thinking about, um, you know, how to sort of optimize around uh, institutional uh, e-book collections is a m much more of a build-it-yourself strategy. This is something that uh, Duke University Press has done quite successfully, but uh, not many other university presses have. Um, it is a question of margin on sales, right, if it's not intermediated, um, higher margin on those sales, but it's also a question of really controlling our own um, digital uh, mission. And so, you know, a central part of our strategy is designing and creating our own uh, ebook subscription platform. Um, and again, in very close collaboration with the MIT libraries, which is uh, uh, a wonderful thing about the relationship between the press and the libraries at MIT. Um, so, you know, partnership is, is a key uh, phrase in what I've been talking about. And one of the trends I'm seeing in university presses, and I'm sure that Charles will talk more about this too, is um, the way in which the presses are sort of pivoting much more towards their institutions and how they're serving their institutions. And so in our case, um, you know, in the last couple of years, just, um, you know, many, many new partnerships with academic publishing units on campus um, that might have, for example, a department publishing a book series might have, you know, outsourced uh, that capacity in the past. Uh, partnerships with other publishing ventures at MIT, like Technology Review and Sloan Management Review, uh, new journals, uh, partnerships around, um, you know, MITx courses and the books that come out of those courses. Um, so, you know, publishing services is definitely a growing theme in university press publishing, and it certainly is in our case. You know, if we have, uh, you know, the capacity around editorial design and production, around fulfillment, around inventory. Um, we should be providing those services on our campus, and it's indeed a growing source of revenue um, for us. Um, and we're finding, actually, not only is it, is it serving our partners at MIT, but we've been able to help other universities very quickly stand up university presses using our infrastructure. So we uh, had a partnership that we launched last year with Goldsmiths University Press, uh, for example. And then there's the self-publishing piece. Uh, which we're just experimenting with. We have an espresso book machine in our bookstore, which allows members of our community uh, to you know, print and bind books uh, in the store in a matter of minutes. Uh, and there are a range of use cases around that as well. Um, now, um, I recall when I came back to the press being surprised to um, learn that so much of our back file, book and digital, uh, book and um, journal content had never been uh, digitized and a key part of my vision for the press was having this complete uh, backlist for the purposes of preservation, uh, and in some cases making content openly available for both human and non-consumptive uses, um, and then monetizing content um, where it makes sense in terms of our, our new ebook e collections. Uh, you might have seen earlier this week we announced a partnership with um, the Internet Archive to digitize very old, you know, deep backlist stuff that has not seen the light of day for a long time. And we're very excited about that. It's a, 
uh, preservation solution and, an, and an, um, kind of an open lending solution at the same time. Um, and I also see it as, as a way in which we're responding to the piracy that I talked about. You know, we're getting out in front of it and saying, you know, we are authorizing this content to be out there uh, in the world and reflecting, um, just a couple of minutes, yeah, um, like the interests uh, of our authors at the same time. So just very quickly, um, a, a bunch of other sort of experimental things we're doing. We have a partnership with the New York uh, Public Libraries to have parts of our books available to riders on the New York City subway system, um, which we're exploring with, again, sort of, uh, chapters of content being open. Um, we're really interested in growing our partnership with Hypothesis on annotation. Uh, we did um, a pilot as part of the JSTOR topograph uh, project that provides uh, more information about the, you know, the, the, the insides of a book uh, to readers trying to make a decision about whether or not the book is relevant. Um, and similarly with UNO, and I talked about this uh, yesterday in terms of all the use cases that we see for UNO conceptual modeling. I'm looking at Erica, because you were the star of my talk yesterday. I talked about, Erica's our metadata librarian, and I was talking about you know, how we think about metadata um, and um, its growing importance in publishing. Um, and then finally, on to Altmetric, um, here's uh, another example of we, we, we're using Altmetric on our books, but another example of where I see um, kind of a partnership across the institution. We're really looking to have Altmetrics used in the library, used in institutional research uh, at MIT. Um, and um, authors love getting these um, alerts. So here's an example of um, you know, an email I got yesterday or the day before alerting me to a new attention paid to a book. Um, uh, that in our collection and where our plan is to automatically register our, our book authors for this so they get this information and I see it as very um, you know important and potentially transformative in terms of giving uh, authors data points that they can use in uh, discussing and presenting the broader impact uh, of their research. So um, probably over, over time. Uh, so part of my, my plan for the future is to take all these sort of little things that I talked about uh, and develop a kind of space outside of kind of the core uh, publishing uh, mission of the press and books and journals to keep really pushing on those and, and seeing you know, what sticks. And we think about it as our, our publishing futures lab. And a, another key piece of that will be that kind of author services model. I mean, how can we develop a suite of services that's responsive to uh, what our authors bring us, what kinds of services they need back from their, their, their publishing partner and from their content. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you.